I think guilty of being atheist in that time period. I don't think he was atheist. I also don't think he necessarily believed everything that was handed to him about the gods, but I think that's pretty much everyone in any religion. They don't take, they take everything with a grain of salt, I think. Aaron, was Socrates an atheist? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, just because you question something doesn't mean like you don't believe it. <laughs> Did he corrupt the youth? No, I think he just gave them, like he, he taught them to like, not necessarily like believe in everything to like kind of think a little bit, not necessarily corrupt them, he just, kind of had them, I guess, thinking in their own way. I don't know if you call that corrupting. Well, if I can ask something real quick, I mean, I don't mean to interrupt or anything. Uh, I just want to say, like, yeah, I, like, I agree with what they're saying. Like, what he said, like, I could see where people would say, you know, that is corrupting and stuff like that. Because, I mean, just getting into, like, you know, the minds of the kids and stuff like that. But, like, I don't think that was, like, his intent was to necessarily, you know, just, like, say to not necessarily like believe in everything that you've been taught but uh you know just to like kind of question kind of like what you've been like just question your faith and stuff like that not in necessarily a bad way but just kind of like you know you know what you want to believe in and stuff like that so i don't believe he's trying to corrupt them he's just trying to you know open their minds a little bit anybody else so this is what happens at lion college right we accept people from a lot of different I mean, we don't discriminate based on your worldview. So we're going to have students with different worldviews. That's a given. And so in this class, we talk about that, right? Uh, you can sort of get through the school without ever talking about it or thinking about it, but the school is designed for you to think about it. Do you think um, the process of examining your religious beliefs or your customs you grew up with um, I mean, don't you, can't you uh, understand how some parents think that they're worried that their kids are going to lose their faith if they go to Lyon College? Have any of you ever heard that? I mean, I've heard that about a lot of liberal institutions that they teach you to turn away from like this, this, and that. But I think that I don't know. I was raised in Episcopalian culture, and um, their main tenet is God loves everyone, no exceptions. So I think that I didn't experience that, but a lot of people probably did. Um, okay, and then, <coughs> excuse me, the other thing is, does what Socrates do undermine democracy? Because he got blamed, right, for how why Athens fell apart. He was the scapegoat. Was that fair? Um, I don't think that was fair. I actually think that like, uh, like, uh, like Socrates, he asked a lot of people a lot of questions and they came to their own conclusions. And then I think that those people spread those conclusions. And I think that if you, uh, if you look at anybody for like guilt, it would rather be the, the people that spread their own conclusions that they only came to by being asked questions. Um, yeah. What else happens when somebody knows they're absolutely right? Can that get used by politicians who can hide their ulterior motives behind religious beliefs? Most definitely. Okay. Okay. So, um, so there is a reason for politicians to leave out, um, to leave out religion, not to talk about religion when they're talking about public policy. How many of you think politicians should not talk about religion when they're talking about public policy, what sort of laws they want to pass and why? Okay. Um, does everybody want to give, anyone want to elaborate on that? Well, I believe so, because if, it, if say if I'm um, Buddhist and somebody else is Christian and we're just talking or like it's, you can't really argue over something when y'all both believe two different things but if the like the, the justice system is justice system and the and all that stuff but 
if you believe in two different things, then it's like it's just clashing back and forth with no result. So that's what me, that's what I think, at least. And to that point, whenever you introduce any type of religion into uh, legislative, you're always going to have different viewpoints. So I think putting that into it is like what Tim was saying. It's just, it it won't be beneficial for anyone because it's not going to change other people's opinions. It's just going to limit the scope of what is deemed okay instead of opening up a discussion about it. Is it also going to polarize people? Definitely. Yeah, so religion has been weaponized or it's easily weaponized. And that's the opposite of what the message of every religion is God loves everybody, right? And then the way it gets politicized is, you know, God loves me and not you is exactly the opposite. Um, so beware. Um, Colin, do you think Socrates is guilty? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I really don't know. Hold on. I'm just trying to get somewhere like where there's less people. Um, <coughs> I want to say no. Like, he kind of does as he wants. I mean, as long like the way I see guilt is like if you morally feel wrong and like completely disagree with yourself like everyone else thinks that you're guilty but you don't I kind of side with the person who doesn't for the most part because it's just like a perspective thing in my opinion well let's see so if you don't think you're an atheist nobody else could tell you you're an atheist I mean you can tell me what you think I am, but that doesn't mean like I will believe you right? until I believe in myself. Well, actually, the, the notion the Greeks have of spiritual humanism, living for the sake of something greater than yourself. I mean, somebody might call a person who embraces that view religious, right? Because it's spiritual, but they might call them an atheist because it's not monotheism or Christianity, right? So that's the first opinion, the first worldview we get in this class already has a whole lot of ambiguity built into it about these issues. So that's kind of the main point is that we're, we have a foundation that can go either way. And so then as you're working out your worldview, you sort of figure out, you know, how do I put all the pieces together? But as far as I'm concerned, it's about as open as you get in terms of allowing for any kind of other ideology or philosophy. Um, the next issue are some of those articles, right? Um, oh, well, the next issue would be analogies. Did you see analogies between um between Athens and Sparta and the Revolutionary War or the Cold War or any or the war on terrorism or anybody see any analogies between Athens and Sparta and the wars that we fought what about in Ukraine what's that about what do you all oh uh, yeah oh my bad I didn't mean to interrupt there um yeah, uh, kind of like when it comes to like, like the reference points, I can kind of see like, especially when it comes to like Ukraine and Russia, because like, you know, one side, is just, it just looks like they're kind of attacking for basically no reason. It seems like, you know, when it comes to Russia, you know, like, you know, they say they have the reasons, but I mean, it's pretty unclear. And that just kind of goes like, well, you know, like with the Spartanians, you know, how they just like wanted to go and to show, you know, their brute force and all that. And, uh, you know, but, you know, war is supposed to be, you know, for the sake of peace and stuff like that. So I can definitely see the reference point uh, in that situation. Yeah, Russia wants to um, recapture some of those old countries, right? It's imperialism. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, right. Okay. Anybody else see any analogies with any of American history that they've read or they know or what's going on right now?
nothing. Okay, what about um, anybody see analogies between um, Socrates and Jesus? Nothing. Nobody. Well, could I speak on on the fifth one? Sure. Okay. So usually, what what I'm gonna speak on where it says, "Why do history keep repeating itself?" I would say because, like in other words, hard headed. Just want to say that like people think they could think it doesn't relate to them, and then it keeps reoccurring constantly, thinking they could change. You could think they could change the outcome of certain things. But you can't if you don't, you know what I'm saying? So like every action has a reaction. So in, in, in a sense, it's gonna keep repeating itself if you don't wanna change it. If you just think it's not gonna happen because it's, that's back in the old times, you're wrong. That's right. The other issue here is that this stuff doesn't happen by accident. It's driven by people's ideas. So when you read history, you might say, well, it's driven by hunger or, or power, or it's driven by fear, whatever. But it really isn't driven by fear. People don't walk around saying, I'm afraid, so I'm going to attack you. It's driven by somebody's ideas about their fear, right? What's the cause of the fear? And so they killed Socrates, not because they don't say I'm looking for a scapegoat goat. I'm a jerk. So I'm going to kill Socrates. They have a reason, right? So that's why you have to think about what, how you think, because how you think is going to drive your behavior. And you could make some really serious mistakes uh, because you have the wrong idea. Does that make sense to you all? Um, so I realize this material is imprecise and it's not knowledge in a traditional sense, but history is really driven by these kinds of complexities and ambiguities and imprecise ideas. All right, so everybody has to clock in on one of these two articles. Here's one where back in uh, Richard Nixon's campaign, somebody decided that they want to make political campaigns into uh, corporate campaigns. You're just selling the president and you sell them like you sell a bar of soap or a car. You don't, um, you just talk about the product, the brand, the competition. So to what extent does our political system ba be based on something like this, right? That, well, I, it's part of my brand to be, it's just a brand. I'm a Democrat, Republican, it has nothing to do with policies, it's just my brand. Or people sell during the campaigns, they sell without mentioning policies. Okay, go ahead, guys. What do you think? Like, I think 100%. I think that no one was, if, okay, a lot of, Americans especially are not into politics like that. It's more of a popularity contest who they feel like they can relate to. And it began back in the 1960s when the televisions were pretty much in every single home. So they got to actually see their presidents, not just hear about them through the newspaper or through the radio. So to see this person like with JFK, he was a very young, charismatic man. And since then, we've seen the presidency be almost like a popularity contest. Who do they feel they can have a sit down dinner with? That's more important than what their policy actually is, in my opinion. There's evidence for that, Jordan, right? Um, yeah. It's not just an opinion. Like, it's important for you because, you know, there's evidence for that. Okay, Michael, what do you think? Do you think the campaigns don't talk about issues? They just are basically like corporate advertising? Uh, well, I think they they do talk about issues, but I kind of framed it in a not in a not in a different way. Um, but I talked about how um, specifically this, and you kind of mentioned it in the lecture video. Um, it made me think about the issues like with the, the the two party system create more specifically, like 
forcing individuals into being like liberal or conservative uh, when like a lot of times, not a lot of times, almost all the time you do lie somewhat in the middle. Um, and I talked about like how uh, politics polarizes like these big ticket issues uh, and makes them like the only point of each party. Um, uh, an example, uh, and this is like, I'm not going at each party when I say this, but like, if you're liberal, you like to kill babies. And if you're conservative, you like to run around shooting guns. You know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, and I think like in turn, you, you turn politics into like a sort of game of whether you support this single idea or this one. Um, and that forces you to kind of get boxed in when like, it's, it, it's a much bigger picture. Um, but I think like with how the media is now, like I said, it, it, it moves into these, these single, single uh these single ideas instead of the larger larger picture also you really demonize the other side you find the darkest way to describe them right okay did, did um because i didn't really like follow politics prior to uh going to college but like before like president trump did you see as much um did you see as much uh uh i don't know um, it troll <laughs> polarity like, between parties yes did you see as much polarity between parties yeah well what do you guys I would say yeah but not to this extent at least from what i've seen it was very much like the a lot of most recent politics is what you were talking about single point issues so like, people join one side or the other because oh i feel very strongly about this point alone and i like what you're saying people are dualities they shouldn't like oh if i believe this then i'm automatically this but you can have beliefs that align with both parties but that's not really what's being pushed in the agenda lately what what is it what are your priorities what do you really want your politicians to do number one right what do they have the power to do okay so let me put it this way does a politician have the power to not allow a woman to get an abortion or is she gonna get one anyway? I feel like they have the power to influence but not to just make them not do it. You can get it without the politician knowing. So why do they make such a big deal out of it when basically there's gonna be the same number of abortions or even more when it's illegal. Why do they make a big deal out of it? I mean, is it not sort of like a political game? Like you, you get more support if you, uh, you know, if you do it that, that way, then you're gonna get more support from voters in your party. What are they whitewashing? What is it they really do have the power to do? I think it's gonna have control over women's bodies, to be honest. I feel like it's trying to take us back in time because like you said, or the question which I thought was rhetorical because I mean obviously legislation is not gonna stop abortion like it's an obvious answer because does making drugs illegal stop it no but it still happens it's gonna go underground so it's not gonna eliminate abortions in all it's just gonna like I did um, an anthropology paper about it like it's just gonna hurt like African Americans it's gonna hurt um, people of color people who's uh, underprivileged, like um, with money and stuff like that. That's the people that's going to be like directly affected. And so I think it has to do a lot about control and kind of what Michael was saying. Um, when people such as Donald Trump, which I feel like is such a poster person for the fact of having a brand, I feel like that's what really sold him was people loved his personality. I mean, like as many people, as many people hated him, a lot of people loved him because he was so crazy. He was so um, you know, so outspoken, like he was so strong in his convictions. And I feel like um, that was his brand, being crazy. And uh, his persona helped him, I think, get a lot of votes, at least from my from people I hear. So um, that's, I feel like it's about control. And also maybe he got, you know, that kind of strong opinions helps with the polls because people want to belong to a certain thing. People want to feel included. So people like to associate with a certain party. What should you be looking for, however? Well, I wanted to get to what, um, sorry, I think it was Ryan was saying. Like it's about autonomy versus economy. It's about 
what they think they are able to control. And like when abortion was first legalized in the 80s, they saw a vast uprise of deaths due with back alley abortion. So it came back with Roe versus Wade. And so that was almost eradicated. And in addition to that, the deaths of motherhood in, in, my, in the United States versus other first world countries is abhorrent. We're at like 19% versus other countries at the highest are at 8%. So it's a lot to do with healthcare and how we take care of women in particular when it comes to this subject. Okay, so what I'm getting at is what they really can have the power to do is to redistribute wealth, is to tax the rich and set up programs like education, healthcare, um, transportation, parks, right? That's what they really have the power to do. But I don't think the public holds them accountable to that. They keep getting distracted by these very emotion-driven issues that they don't have any power over. Can they make anybody straight who's gay? <laughs> Can they straighten people out? <laughs> I personally think they're trying to control the amount of people in the U.S., like, like the amount of people, like, like I think they're trying to control the population. That's increase, just what I increase the population. Yes, I think that's what they're trying to do. Very good. Why? Because then they, get, in the long term, more money gonna run in, and you got it. Money. Okay, that's one good idea, Tim. That I just read a book about economics. Of chapter one, is you're not going to grow the economy unless you have more people. Uh, so somebody's behind that, right? It doesn't mean everybody, but this is, to me, if you want to really go to the juggler, you've got to go to the money. And also, how do you create a middle class? And that's where I say I'm not Democrat or Republican. Like sometimes cutting taxes for certain businesses is good. Sometimes it's bad. Monopolies are bad. We need antitrust laws, sometimes this, sometimes that, right? So in general, I think when the, when the political system is working well, so I'm going to have to tell you about ancient history, some examples when people, politicians actually got into debates that were relevant. Um, what about should you tax the capital gains people make? So rich people have investments and they make money off their investments without working at all. And poor people don't have capital gains. Should you tax them? Well, the Republicans say no, because you need that money to invest in new ventures, right? You have to have research and development. You have to have money to do all that creative, innovative stuff. Well, okay. But then the, and the, you know, the Democrats keep wanting to tax everything and we don't have money for innovation. Okay. So then you find out that only 7% of, of capital gains is actually used to invest in new ventures, right? Well, then the Democrats come back and they'll say, okay, you'll have to fill out a more uh, form. You know, you have to prove that you're gonna use this money for a new venture and then we'll give you a tax break, right? Um, does everybody understand? Okay, then another one is the mortgage interest deduction. So you can get a deduction on the money you pay to the bank on your loan, your mortgage, okay? And the reason to do that is because it encourages people to buy houses. And when people buy their houses, they're more stable than it just rent and people moving in and out and um, landlords not being accountable, right? So that's important that there's a mortgage interest deduction, but it used to have a cap on it. So if your house is worth X amount or less, because that encouraged people to move into the middle class. All right, when Reagan, was in power, they took the cap off. So when you see these zillion dollar houses, these huge houses, they get a tax break, a big tax break 
for you know have for being rich <laughs> so that just lost the whole idea behind a mortgage interest deduction was to create a middle class and now when you take the lid off the rich get richer again <laughs> and the poor get poorer again because there isn't tax money to give the poor education and health care and all that other stuff tim I just feel as the system kind of is corrupt because why would you want people to stay poor? Like, I feel like they're purposely making sure everybody can stay in their own class instead of everybody can be at least half or wealthy. Because I know wealthy people have more of a break than people who aren't as wealthy. And it's like, well, why can't we all be equal? But then they want to keep the wealthy wealthy. So I think that's kind of corrupt. Well, that's what I think you should keep an, an eye out for when you're looking who to vote for. Does that make sense? Okay, yes. um, Ryan, go ahead. Um, I think just speaking on the question that he posed, like why, um, why would the government want people to be below the middle class? Well, because they need people to, to do those jobs. Like they, not everybody can be rich. Not everybody can be educated. Not everybody can question the government. And so they need people to be working those those jobs that, you know, going to be paying uh, minimum wage. They need those type of people because if not, then how, how is this going to survive? And so I feel like I, I kind of feel kind of strongly about this because my family kind of falls like in like upper middle class. So it's, I feel like it's really hard to say like middle class in general, because what I think it is, is that they're keeping obviously I think what they're doing is they're putting the gap between um, below, like the people doing minimum wage, they're trying to get them up, but then that's closing the gap for them and middle class, but then um, keeping the gap open between upper class and middle class. They want to keep those people up high, but then keep the middle class and then the lower class, they're trying to combine them. And I think, yes, that's good, but at the same time, my family falls like right in that range where we don't get um, like, going up to school, like we didn't get financial aid and all of that stuff because we just didn't qualify. But it's not like, you know, we're doing all of these things. It's not like we're multimillionaires or anything, but, you know, they take, for example, my family, like my parents work really hard and we have a second house and we rent it out, but they take that as income, even though like we're, my parents pay, charge really, really low rent or compared to the other houses around there just because they don't want to raise the rent during like COVID and stuff. And so they don't take that into account. So I feel like it's just, it's a really hard situation. And um, like they're trying to just close the gap between- Right, and that's yeah. right. And so the key is there's a policy issue there, right? And so then you wanna look at, well, what about the super rich, right? They are way undertaxed in the US. Who is interested in trying to get the rich to get to pay more taxes, right? Which politicians, which policies? That would be, does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah, for sure. And I think that's the hard thing about politics and just society, which this sucks. I mean, because nothing's, I don't want to say nothing's going to change, but like my opinion is not going to change politics. But like, I feel like we are always in the position where we have to choose. Like for me, I think people should have the right to bear arms, but yet they should also have, uh, you know, access to abortion, but yet we shouldn't be taxing people as much because I feel like people's money, they deserve the right and they reserve the right for what they want to do with it. So my, like we were talking about, like my opinions, like vary across the board, but in this day and age, when we're voting, it's like we really don't, and unless we're going to go and vote for an independent, which they're not going to win, but it's like, it's always picking and choosing. So we get to value one thing, but then have to disregard another point that we also feel strongly about. It's just weighing what do we feel most strongly about, but I feel like that just sucks because that's why we're never gonna get to, you know, vote. Well, food. actually things have changed a lot in terms of taxing the rich. They really have. Mm -hmm. Under Eisenhower, the maximum tax, break, uh, tax rate was 91%. Under Nixon, it was 75. Under Reagan, it was 50. Under George W, it was 35. Under um, uh, 
uh, Trump, it went down to like 17. I mean, it's huge. Taxing of the rich has really, really changed. Does that, I mean, I do think that's important. Now, you don't have to vote on the basis of that, but that matters a lot to me because I don't, yeah, I think you don't have a democracy when you have a super rich and then just desperately poor people because the, the poor don't have time to get engaged in public life or be informed or participate. And then the rich can walk away from everybody and be in their private schools and their, you know, basically walled communities, gated communities. That's not democracy. Um, does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah, for sure. I think it's just, for me, I, I feel like, I don't know, I'm kind of like a libertarian. I kind of just, I think at a certain point where if you're making like $25 billion a year or something crazy like that, then I feel like maybe there should be a cap. But I feel like if you're anywhere like, like in, you're making like less than five million per year. I feel like it should be lighter taxes, and that's this is my opinion because I have very like lax opinions, or like I guess I'm more on the lax side because I just feel like if people make that make go to school or if they just make it lucky, they deserve to do what they want with their money. And I feel like it's hard for me to say, hey, you need to give this person money because. Right, you have to give the government more money so that they can give to somebody else for, you know, um, EBT or things like that. I just feel like for me, I am somebody who feels like it's some that's their money. Like, I just don't feel like it should be as heavily taxed to a certain extent. So I feel like, like that's just for me. Well, how much more do you okay. go ahead, Jordan? I think that our current structure is intentionally putting the middle class and the lower class against each other. Um, specifically because if we join together, we could change a lot. We've seen it before in like 1960s when people started writing the bus system specifically to uh, go against racism. It made them change their policies because they can't afford that. They understand that the people in itself, what we decide that we can put our money into versus don't want to put our money into, that's what matters. But then again, they get money from the top percentage in order to not put an interest into things that would publicly help everyone because they benefit off that. Like for, uh, for profit prisons, there's incentive for people to be arrested because it gives companies more money and more free labor. So in general, I think that taxes in itself should be more taxable to the rich, but I also see the need to tax the middle class versus the lower class. I'm, my family's firmly in the upper middle class but I still understand the need to have certain taxes taken out for public, like public uh, transportation, public education, uh, public community projects. Those are very important in order to have a livable community, but the current system is so individualized about people thinking about their personal needs, their personal beliefs, that it doesn't see the, everyone as a whole. That's my belief, at least. Anybody else? Because that's what Athens, member of the lecture on the Athens was set up to get people to think as citizens, right? Rather than just the freedom to do whatever you want. So anyway, that's, that's one issue. Like, what are your priorities and which things matter the most to you? And having a whole list of, of possibilities, foreign policy, tax policy, lots of incredible number of issues. What about this one? This was done, this was written before 9-11, just a few months before 9-11. Already he's saying the problem with all this speed and the frantic energy is that undermines creativity. Creativity is usually when, you're, when you've got some leisure time, you're in the shower or something, your brain has a chance to be creative. If your brain is always multitasking, literally, like we're, there are brain scans showing that we are destroying our brains. We have this white matter right back in the back of our brain and it's either not developing or it's shrinking. Whereas the part that's you know interfacing with the world is, is uh, sort of degenerating because it's way overstimulated. So, um, so this 
Right, when Jesus, uh, Jesus, when Socrates says an unexamined life, right, is not worth living, he does mean this. He means you have to reflect on stuff. So any, so does anybody want to clock in on that point? Do you think having all everybody on their machine all the time is a problem in terms of learning how to think clearly about citizenship? Um, I think it's the way that we use like technology that has uh, like one of the, the quotes I took out of there was like, uh, uh, like if we if, if things didn't move so fast, there'd be time to reflect instead of react. Um, but I think that like you can still use technology in a way where you can reflect instead of react. Um, but I think that like, uh, I think that like with social media and like just the, the the rate at which like we do exchange information now um there's just far less like critical thinking that you have to do in order to reflect instead of react um and that also like causes people to get you know defensive one of the things that like uh they talk maybe you talked about this in your video but um that they talk about like with socrates is that like um when you tend to question somebody's like worldview nowadays um, they tend to get defensive. No one wants to get into like uh, intellectual conversation. Okay, somebody else, um, Colin, what do you think? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? My internet's a little glitchy That's here. Okay, what I really okay, I'll I'll wait because I really want you to talk about the next article on big brains, small minds, on STEM. Did you okay? Um, okay, Aaron, do you uh, do you have a comment on the fast pace of the? I, it's an open question, you know. I mean, I think it's I think people are too focused on short term and like getting instant like serotonin and whatnot instead of like focused on like actually what's beneficial so like everyone's just turning into like mice pretty much like in the simulations and that i guess that's my opinion on that and political advertising is sort of designed to make them that way right it's all little short clicks, just 10 second sound bites. Okay. And it's gone from like thought out like news and stuff to like 30 seconds. And now it's just getting shorter and shorter. What about you, Zane? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Well, just do you think um, being on social media and having constant input is making it harder to be reflective and to think about the big picture do you think that's uh yeah uh i think i do just i mean it's hard for me to like explain it but i believe it is like harder for people nowadays to kind of get the bigger picture on things i mean especially when it comes to like more serious topics and i don't I, like i can't really explain like what it is about it but uh yeah i mean i can definitely tell like where that uh where that's relevant all right so here i'm going to try how many more there's this one is the one i wanted colin to respond to big brain small minds about the relation between the stem uh fields and the humanities and you know it's like i bribed the guy to write this article right um it just says that that basically the humanities is about asking questions and it's about reflecting and the STEM stuff is just a very different kind of thinking. Um, and it's becoming more and more rare, right? The humanities, nobody majors in it or humanities majors can't get jobs. And, um, and it, the Athenians had a high tech society, but then they went and became corrupt and wasted all their, uh, they went, they fought on too many fronts and ended up losing the war. That was because of their arrogance. It wasn't because they weren't technologically capable. It's because of their emotional arrogance. They would never believe that they could lose. They thought they could control everything. 
Um, is the aim of education money and power? Um, where can we turn for help in knowing what to do with the money and the power? And so that's what Socrates says, right? There's these three goals. There's pleasure and wealth, power and glory, or wisdom and justice. And that's what the humanities should always be asking you. What is your ultimate goal? And it doesn't mean that you're never motivated by money. It just, it, you don't have to end up getting hemlock or starving to death. It's just, when um, push comes to shove, what are your priorities? So um, everybody who wants to speak on this one, there's this one and then there's how humanities can help fix the world. And that one also has um, about needing to, um, this guy is a German, right? Um, he taught in a German department and he asks, you know, is it possible to have a society full of young people who are creative, energetic, entrepreneurial, technologically informed, and wholly con comfortable with mass slaughter? It's like, yes, the Germans. Um, but, uh, you know, I would be curious what your reaction to that article is. Um, okay, and then the financial recover made it even harder for the humanities groups. This guy was talking about anti-Semitism and racism, that certain kids in a fraternity were singing racist songs and it didn't even occur to them that that was offensive. There was something wrong with that. And we do have this whole issue of cancel culture. Uh, what triggers one person isn't another. And um, what can the humanities I think, you know, thinking about it in a humanities class, getting some perspective, stepping back, what does it mean matters. Um, for example, I mean, there are girls who get raped. And when a teacher talks about rape, it might trigger her, right? There might be legitimate lectures that really she can't control. It's a trauma or race, right? I mean, people are traumatized by these things. But on the other hand, you know, people can get hypersensitive. And um, I'm not sure, I'm just saying it's complicated and it is an issue. Um, in a humanities course, you step back. Humanists build humanity one work of art at a time, right? It just, you have to step back and figure out how you want to create humanity, your humanity, um, your culture. This one is that so many university professors get rewarded for very abstract ideas and they don't have any concrete application. So you can think about that in your own education. Um, and they're emphasizing interdisciplinary. So obviously I prefer interdisciplinary, but have you ever taken classes that are so specialized? They don't really have anything to do with life. And then the, um, the last one is moderates, what moderates believe. So let me just start out by asking each of you to, to speak on whatever of those articles you wanted to speak on. So Alyssa, were there one or two articles you wanted to speak about? Um, I thought the stuff about the humanities, uh, like humanities students was interesting, especially since like I'm a humanities major um, because like um, it just makes me think how people all like, you know, STEM degrees are important and we need STEM majors in the world obviously but we just get uh humanities majors just get so like discredited for their roles in the world and like in a way I think um we make the world a little more like human and so um I thought that one was particularly interesting but it was rather specific to me <laughs> well why are you a humanities major I just felt like for me, that was the best way I could apply myself to help out like my communities. Like, um, like I'm from 
rural Southeast Texas. And then I go to Lyon, which is rural Arkansas. And like, I want to go into a master's program that focuses on rural and local uh, government. And so I just found that that was the best way for me to actually connect and have an impact on people in my area rather than going into STEM. And I wasn't very good at STEM things. <laughs> So do you think understanding history or understanding literature, which humanities do you think helps you function or help you function in a local government? Um, definitely for me, understanding history, because um, I mean, rural communities aren't anything new. And like from the beginning of history, they've had an impact on uh, major like cities and stuff from like the twine revolution which started out in the fields that led to other things I just feel like understanding history is such an important part of preparing for the future rather than just like focusing on creating it okay very good Ryan what about you well speaking on that um I well, right now I'm looking to major in political science and international studies, but something that I might not be able to fit in is anthropology. And for me, I know that political science, like that's, I'm going to go into law, so that's like a no brainer for me to just go into that. But anthropology was something that holds at like my heart or like my soul because of the conversations that we had, especially with my background coming from Hawaii, really pushed me and the class to dig deeper about like cultures and like indigenous cultures and that's something that I find really important and that we can learn a lot from and so um, like she, like uh, Alyssa was saying earlier just bringing like a more human side to the world I feel like that's what humanities type of classes um, bring but I'm not going to discredit things like STEM and political science because I was in my classes and I was telling my professor that my classes in political, like my political science classes had like information that kind of, it didn't conflict with my anthropology classes, but it also showed a different perspective. So um, it, it was a little conflicting, but not really, just like a little bit. And so it was good to get both sides, especially studying those two different um, studies, but I thought that was really interesting. Do you think the professors maybe are are specialized, and then when it's you who learn how to think um, in a more interdisciplinary way, or do you think most of the professors are pretty interdisciplinary? I think most of them are pretty interdisciplinary, but um, I think being uh, put in a situation where you're looking when I'm going from back to back classes, and then we're talking about kind of similar things, but in different perspectives, it also pushes me to directly look at both sides, you know, instead of maybe 10 years ago, they thought of both sides, but maybe now they're not because they're only focused on what they're teaching in their class. So um, yeah, but I think the professors are really good at being open minded. But I think it's also what you do with that information as a student is what really separates you from just sitting in the class to excelling in the class. Okay, so you, every student puts the stuff together in their own way, right? You're being creative in your thinking and then in the way you live and then in the career you go to and what you do with it. So everything becomes creative at a certain point. Does that make sense, Ryan? Okay, so there isn't to think there's one and only one answer is really not what liberal education is about, because the future leaders have to be creative. They've got to create things that adapt to the times, right? Because um, you're going out into a new generation, you've got to figure out how to be effective in the world that you're going into. And you're never, there's no one right answer to that. Um, Okay, Michael. Um, I, I don't really have, uh, I talked about the other articles. Um, I did read through the Big Brain Small Minds article. Um, the only thing that I really, the only thing that I really gathered was, um, well, not gathered, but uh, thought about was, um, I guess how humanities 
uh, ha, tends to focus on more like abstract thought, um, which is like something that we obviously need to have, especially uh, in, in regards to like uh, in regards to politics or, or like governance or that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, you spoke before, so that's fine. What about you, Tim? Did you pick one of those four articles? Was anything that stood out? Well, what stood out with me, I don't want to, I hate to kind of repeat, but the humanities one, obviously I'm not a humanities major, but I feel like it's, it's very like downplayed. Like it's not as well talked about as it should be, especially how people are um, doing these other majors. Like that, that major is, it should be pretty good for people to start knowing about and to get to um, the background for it. Okay. So when you read literature, you're trying to understand how somebody else's mind works, right? And when you're understanding how somebody else's mind works, you kind of learn about your own mind. Yeah, it opens right? you up. And then, and also you learn that, gee, other people think totally differently. And then if you look at history, how much does the history of your country or your local history affect the way people are thinking, right? Different perspectives can change your perspectives. And then religion, like how do people's religious beliefs affect everything? And so, yeah. And then the culture, like Ryan says, I think the anthropology speaks about a lot of aspects of culture. To me, a culture is like a petri dish, right? When you have a culture, literally a culture of a bacteria culture, human beings have the same kind of thing. Like there's a certain atmosphere and, and there's feedback loops, right? And the culture just becomes a big feedback loop and people adapt to it or they step outside of it. So when Athens started to decline, a whole lot of people either didn't notice or they adapted to it. They just said, well, might makes right, that's reality. Uh, let's just go for it. And Socrates was the outlier, right? He said, no, we gotta get back to the original idea. Like we've destroyed the whole spirit of the country. And that's a paradigm for what can happen in any society. So there's stuff that, there's these trends that are unique to any culture. And then there's the stuff that keeps repeating itself. And again, that's a creative um, comparison and contrast. You have to sort of come up with your own conclusion about your particular moment at, in time when you're creating something, a job or a life. Um, Colin, what did you think about the stuff on STEM versus humanities? So, I have a couple of things I would like to say, but mainly when we learn about history, we learn about the arts, we learn about the artwork, we learn about what happened. We don't really talk about STEM, in my opinion, is also the application of weapons and things of that nature. So back in the day, they were all small until the atomic bombs and the world wars, then STEM really started to take a forefront within history and the history teachings. Um, then you see people like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs becoming madly successful because of the time that they entered the technological internet, all that stuff. It's just the time of this generation. Um, I think humanities and things of that nature are very important and you will gain it eventually, but from a little kid, STEM is kind of the field that especially me, was like pushed into and to try to figure out more because they kind of see like STEM as the future with all the technological advances and being able to cure diseases that we didn't think that we could cure and stop bacteria and all that things. So they see that as like high and mighty sometimes, but also war sparks a lot of STEM advancements. So especially all the wars that's happened, it leads this generation that we're in at a very like specific spot in history that no one's really 
been in with the technology that we have and everything of that nature. Right. So, I mean, it really is interesting if you put it together, like Facebook, right? High tech, Mark Zuckerberg. And then you go back to these very raw, primitive emotions, right? And you put those together. So we have these emotions that aren't going to go away, but technology um, affects them, right? And it, it has this effect. So I, yeah, I do think the history of technology, but it always is the case that people think the next best thing, right? They get this new technology. It's like, oh, this is great. And then it gets taken over the dark side. The primitive drives get a hold of it. Does that make sense, Colin? Yeah, okay. And then also Bill Gates now is doing green stuff. So the next wave is going to be the green thing and how that plays out. But also just the fact that we live so long because the medicine has an incredible impact on society, like women's rights. Women just don't want to sit home after they get a couple of kids raised, right? From age 40, 35 until age 90, right? So back in the day, you spent a lot of your time raising kids. And because of STEM, you don't. And so that's changed things too. Um, does that make sense, Colin? That you could look at the whole effect of STEM on ideas, you know, all the cultural stuff too. Um, Zane, what do you think? I'm um, just kind of going back to like, the part about like how like everything you do like especially when you go in the career field like you know just everything becomes creative and stuff like that and like just going along with like like a big you know like a i'm losing my train of thought but like it's a big thing to be creative especially like with the culture and like the technology just constantly changing i think that's like especially today i think just of how fast everything's going i think it's like big it's a bigger deal today than it has been in the future or in the past so stepping back is uh, humanities wants you to step back, right? And look at the bigger picture. Otherwise you could be afraid of change, right? Right. Okay. And feel like you don't have control. Mm -hmm. um, Jordan? Yep. Um, I gave most five views for the first article we discussed. But then uh, about the humanities, I think that uh, humanities are often the first to be cut simply because it allows for abstract thought. And uh, as seen through many fascist regimes, the use of abstract thought has been thought to be counterintuitive in teaching a whole nation to think a certain way. Um, I, not to necessarily say that that's the intention, but that's often used. I also think that um, you need one to have the other. Like psychology, for instance, you have to have a scientific basis in order to have anything be accurate psychology. As seen with the uh, asylums in the 60s, didn't have any like scientific basis for a lot of the things they subjugated people to. Um, but with the introduction of that, it's actually become a legitimate science. What? What didn't they? They didn't introduce a lot of scientific. I mean, they've had scientific thought. Psychology in itself is the mix between philosophy and science. That is what it stems from. But, or religion, philosophy, and science. But I think that with the introduction of more science within psychology, it's made it more legitimate field. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I wrote on neuroscience, this scientist. Uh, and how the Greeks had anticipated a lot of what the neuroscientists are saying now. So that's another story. Um, Aaron. I, I mean, I honestly think that like, it is in STEM, like, no, I think that there should be like a mixture. Cause I think that's what they're saying about STEM inducing or not stem um humanities inducing like abstract thought like that can be very helpful in the world of stem like i think there should be you should have a combination of both that's okay. kind of well i mean 
I wouldn't. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you think these patterns that we're looking for, you know, how um, the rise and fall, I don't know if that's abstract. That's kind of just looking for underlying um, drives, right? What is it that doesn't change over time as opposed to what does change over time? Um, okay, so so I with with Socrates' apology, it is one of the major cornerstones of what you call Western liberal democracies, for better or worse. Um, but for 2,500 years, people have been debating, have been reading about Plato and thinking about it. And so the reason I like to teach it is because you're in on the conversation. And but every generation has to take it and adapt it to their society. So there's things about it that really annoy me. One thing is that Plato, he said it's very important for children to get habituated well, but he doesn't give any credence to, to women, mostly women, who actually do that. <laughs> so the way our society is structured is that it's very difficult for women to juggle family and career between age 25 and age 40. You're expected, you know, that's when people normally have kids and that's when they're expected to really work hard in their careers. So, so I mean, that was, that's a flaw that we still have to keep working on if we really want everybody to flourish. So that's one thing that um, annoyed me about it. But in general, Socrates, that he represents that reflective capacity. You step back. So to me, he is like a personification of the liberal mind, the free mind. So Socrates won't blindly accept anything. You remember he alienated the Democrats because they were trying to do some trumped up charges in a jury and he didn't go for it. And then he alienated the conservatives because they were trying to do the same thing. And he said, I could have gotten killed for it, but the tyrants got overthrown before they had time to go kill me, but then the Democrats go kill them. <laughs> and um, so if you can at least intuitively understand the value of having a free mind and how much work it is, because it's really, really hard sometimes when you wanna just think something is, is clear and then somebody comes along and says, well, wait a second, and then you have to think twice. And um, just accepting complexity and ambiguity and being fair to different points of view. So um, that, and that that's difficult. That's not trivial. That's a very difficult thing. And then I did wanna point out to you that here we are, I mean, we're in a class with a lot of different students with different backgrounds. And this is becoming more and more rare in our society where people actually get together around a table um, who have different points of view. And we're talking about points of view. And I'm sorry that I keep dominating the conversation because I really would like for you next time, try to raise your hands or take turns so that I don't need to call on you. Is that all right? Because I, I really, I want you to create this community. It's your world, right? It's not my world. I've passed down a world to you that I really regret. I grieve what it is that you're inheriting. It's not trivial. And we could have prevented a lot of this stuff. I know because I was there. <laughs> And we didn't. And so now you have this. And I don't know how um, aware you are of how difficult it's going to be. But I definitely just want you to talk to your peers and figure out how you can avoid polarizing. Because I hope you have a commitment that you don't want that to happen. 
but that is the fallback position. And I hope you, you know, learn to develop the art of dialogue and understanding that everybody's coming at this from a different perspective. And even at Lyon College, there are these subdivisions and subcultures, but the overall culture is this, <laughs> right? The characteristics of a free mind. So on the one hand, it might look like it's not precise. It's just a bunch of bullshit. You just want your opinion. And it's nothing you know, serious. There's no test, blah, blah, blah. But I think in terms of the mental strength it takes and the combination of emotional and intellectual and stepping back, that, that is not easy, I don't think. So that's what we're doing. Now, next time, Okay, so on Saturday morning, you have your weekly post is due. It has the worldview. It has your reaction before class to the readings. Okay, the first one is the worldview and the reaction to the first class. Then you have another right next to it, it's one piece of paper, your thoughts before the class, second class, then your thoughts after, and whether you think anything in that uh, lesson you might want to include in the worldview. Then the third one, before class, after class, if there's anything that stuck out to you. And then the last one, Friday, blah, blah, okay? Then um, I have some paper topics. Now, if you'd rather, um, okay, so usually it's due on Sunday night, but this is the 4th of July and you know, so I'm going to not make it due till Tuesday. If you don't have that much to do on the 4th of July, yeah, you should do it, but I'm not going to make you do it. Um, and I have paper topics and I will put them on the, let's see, I think I put them right on the, the little place in the stream where it says paper number one. So I think I put the paper topics there and I will do it again. I will check right now to make sure. And some of those paper topics include the Crido because I usually um, finish up with that. But um, so you don't need to write on that. You can if you want to, you can read ahead. Anyway, it has a thousand words, whatever. But you do have your post is due by tomorrow noon. And then there is a paper that'll be due by Tuesday. Um, any other questions? No? Well, Arkansas time. Oh, yeah, I guess noon Ar uh, Central Daylight time. Um, all right, so have a good 4th of July. I mean, 